Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, Takeo Tuesday and the uh, Pump Selection and Project Builder uh, rebroadcast uh, webinar. My name is Brett Zerba, and I will be uh, introducing the webinar, and then I'll be turning it over to my uh, co-worker and today's uh, presenter, Rich Medeiros. We will be uh, beginning that very shortly. We just like to uh, check a couple of things. I think some of you have been through this before. If uh, if you if you're hearing me, can you uh, raise your hand? Uh, that little green hand there. I see some hand up. Oh, good. I do see some question marks, but uh, I think that just had to do with uh, uh, people saying hi and greetings. But I see hands, so that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a little smoother broadcast uh, uh, today. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, uh, we will be uh, answering questions uh, throughout, so there is a question area there. So uh, please ask your questions, and we'll uh, make sure we uh, uh, get those answered to, to the best of our ability. We'll work them in throughout uh, Rich's uh, presentation. Also, uh, there is a PDH credit, one-hour credit, available for this uh, uh, presentation. It will be available and sent to you tomorrow. Uh, roughly one uh, one day after the broadcast. Okay, uh, some of you have been through it before. You get an email uh, with uh, with the uh, video of the broadcast as well as uh, access to your PDH credits. So uh, please keep that in mind. Also, the uh, credit will also uh, be uh, excuse me. The video is also available through the Takeo website, and that's the page of the um, uh, where the uh, Takeo Tuesday uh, information is uh, listed. So uh, they're all uh, uh, kept there, and uh, so you have access to them er there as well. Uh, so keep that in mind. So we're going to be begin in a second. I think I covered all my uh, introduction stuff. Just a couple of things here. What uh, Rich is going to be covering is how to generate and read a pump curve. What is pump water horsepower, and how is it different from pump motor horsepower? How do you calculate pump efficiency? What is NPSH? Uh, what are the different types of pump types and pump configurations? How to use the Takeo Pump Selection app to select a pump? What is the Project Builder all about? And how to use the Pump Selection app and Project Builder to troubleshoot field problems? So, uh, welcome everybody, and uh, I will be working questions in as we go. But Rich, I'm going to turn it over to you. Take it away, my friend. Well, thanks, Brett, for that great introduction, and welcome, everyone, to our Takeo Tuesday. And as Brett mentioned a moment ago, this is the uh, Pump Selection app and Project Builder. So let's just uh, get into and repeat the agenda of what's going on. Um, let's click on here, make sure my thing works. There it goes. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. And... Uh, just as a quick housekeeping check, since we're just getting started, Brett, if you could come back on the audio and let me know that you can hear me and see everything okay. 10-4, Rich, I can see your uh, uh, pump selection slash takeo project builder screen, and, and I can hear you fine. Great. Thanks, Brett, for that feedback. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know a lot of folks are working from home because of the uh, challenges that we have in front of us, so hopefully you'll get something uh, out of this presentation. So uh, as the agenda says, we're going to jump in a moment right into how to generate and read a pump curve, and what is pump ho water horsepower, and how is it different from pump motor horsepower. So we're going to start right off with uh, uh, how to generate and read a pump curve. I'll just change the screen here for a moment. There we go. There we go. Great. So how do we generate and read a pump curve? Well, the way we do it is actually in the test lab itself. So I'm going to blow this picture up. There it goes. Fits nicely on the screen. So we have one of our technicians that's getting ready. <clears throat> I brought some water for me to drink so I don't lose my voice today. Sorry about that. So um, one of the technicians in our mechanical test lab is setting up an end suction pump for testing. And he's going to uh, use this to create a pump curve. So just to point out a few things, um, I'm using my cursor here to show you the suction pipe. It has not been uh, fully connected to the entire system, but this is an end suction pump. So the pipe is connected to the end, end of the pump. 
and then it vertically discharges up through this pipe, goes into a larger pipe, and this manual valve control valve here is something we're going to touch on in a few minutes. The water passes through this larger pipe, goes through the wall, and on the other side of the wall, there's a couple of buffer storage tanks. Each one of these tanks is 10,000 gallons, so we have the ability to store and flow uh, 20,000 gallons from these two 10,000 gallon storage tanks. So let's go back to our photograph here. Now he will eventually, between the electric motor right now and the pump, there's nothing there. He will eventually collect, I'm sorry, connect a torque cell. And the torque cell allows us to measure the horsepower input to the pump or the brake horsepower at the pump itself. What's not shown in this photograph, there'll be a small pipe connecting to the suction side of the pump on this uh, larger pipe here that will measure the suction pressure, and there'll be another pipe connected to the discharge side. So let's go to our next photograph here in a moment. Here we go. Um, here you can better see the connections for the pressure taps. And what happened to my... Sorry about that, folks. Just when you want it to go backwards, it's not going. There it goes. Okay. So uh, this is a vertical inline pump that's being set up for testing. And if you'll notice, there's this uh, yellow uh, tube that's connected to the suction side of the pump that's going to measure the suction pressure. And then this red tube is connected to the discharge side of the pump to measure the discharge pressure. And I know you can't see it in this photograph, but way in the back here, there's a little blue device that's going to measure the flow in gallons per minute. So we need four pieces of data. We need to know the flow in gallons per minute. We need to know the suction pressure and the discharge pressure and the power consumed by the pump. So I created a little diagram for you to take a look at. And this little diagram illustrates uh, all the things that we're going to be measuring. So here's the pump at the bottom of the screen. We have a pressure gauge that's measuring the suction pressure. And then we have a gauge measuring the discharge pressure. And then we have this manual control valve over to the right. And if you follow the piping as it leaves the pump, it goes through uh, the control valve into the two buffer storage tanks, and then out the tank, and then through the flow meter. Now, uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, when we measure pressure in the field, we typically measure it in pounds per square inch gauge. But when we measure it in the laboratory, when we publish data, we measured it in feet of water column. And the conversion is 2.31 feet per pound per square inch. So uh, a quick example, if we're measuring a discharge pressure in the field of uh, 30 pounds per square inch and a suction pressure of 20. That's a differential pressure of 10 pounds per square inch. And if we multiply that by 2.31, that would be 10 times 2.31, which would be 23.1 feet. So that's the conversion between uh, pounds per square inch and feet of water column. So one of the very first data points that we collect is when we manually close this control valve here, and we close that valve just for a few seconds and we uh, wait until the flow goes to zero gallons per minute and we measure the pressure differential across the pump. And when we do that, we call that the shutoff head. Sometimes they refer to it in the field as a deadheaded pump. And that's an important piece of data because it relates back to the impeller diameter. And we'll talk about uh, how you can uh, go back and forth between the shutoff head and the impeller diameter to confirm the size of the pump. Okay, uh, so when we start collecting the data, we put it into a spreadsheet format, which looks uh, just like this. And in this particular set of data, we're going to measure uh, the performance of a KS model 4009 pump running at 1760 RPM. And if you'll notice, the first set of data on the left is uh, an impeller diameter of 9.25 inches. And the first data point, just like I pointed out a moment ago, is when we close that control valve, that manual control valve, and it goes to zero gallons per minute. This value here of 84.46 is the shutoff head. 
Efficiency doesn't mean anything at this point, and the horsepower is really not all that important because you're not flowing any water, you're not doing any work. And then the operator then opens the valve and he stops at, in this case, he stopped at roughly 54 gallons per minute, and he has a touch screen, save the data, and it collects the differential pressure, in this case, 84.57 feet. And now the brake horsepower begins to mean something, um, 4.48 horsepower. And the efficiency at this flow in head would be 44.23%. Uh, and so he continues that process and collects the data for all the, the information for the nine and a quarter inch diameter impeller. Uh, and then he, at the end of this test for the nine and a quarter inch, he dismantles the pump and takes the nine and a quarter inch impeller out and then installs an eight inch diameter impeller, repeats the uh, process all over again and collects all the data for the eight inch diameter impeller. And then he does it for a third time, takes the eight inch diameter impeller out and installs a 6.75 inch diameter impeller and repeats the collection of the data. So he, he uses uh, this information and uh, collects the data for three distinct impeller diameters. Okay, so let's uh, look at just the eight inch diameter impeller. We won't uh, look at all the data, we'll just look at some of the data. I'm gonna highlight that in yellow. Let's take that data, move it over to the left of the screen, and then let's put on the screen a, a chart that shows the, the flow in the horizontal axis in gallons per minute and the differential pressure in feet. And in the pump world, we call differential pressure across the pump, the head of the pump. And in the uh, pump world, especially with the um, US units or imperial units or inch pounds units, uh, for the flow, again, it's in gallons per minute, and the differential pressure is in feet of water column. Okay, we're going to take the data that's on the left side of the screen that we collected in the laboratory and plot that data. And so the first data point that I'm going to plot is zero gallons per minute and roughly 60 feet of head. So I go over here at zero gallons per minute, and I go up to 60 feet of head, and I put a, a dot there, a little triangle. Let's see what we got here. There it is. Now I go over to my next data point, 100, which is also roughly 60 uh, feet of head. So there's 100 gallons per minute, 60 feet should be roughly here, and it is. And 258, so there's 200, that's 50, 55, uh, roughly there. That's Hopefully there's a data point there, that's correct. 300 at 53, roughly 300, well there's 50. That would be halfway would be 55, so a little less than half would be 53. And then 400 at roughly 43, that's 400, that's 40, 45, so 43 would be a little less than 45. There's a data point there. And the last data point is 500 gallons per minute at roughly 27 and a half feet. That's 20, that's 500 gallons. That's 20, 25 would be halfway, 27 and a half would be roughly here, and there's the last data point. Okay. So those are the data points that came from the spreadsheet, and we connect each one of those data points with a smooth curve, and ultimately we call that the pump curve, which shows the relationship between the flow and the head. Okay, so uh, at this point, I want to talk a little bit about horsepower uh, relative to motor horsepower and, I'm sorry, uh, pump horsepower and uh, water horsepower. So I'm going to bring up my next slide here. Oh, a little bit too fast. Okay, so uh, the formula for the water horsepower. Um, now, the water horsepower is a theoretical number. It's the amount of work that the pump is doing on the system, and uh, it's essentially uh, the pump uh, as if the pump were running at 100% efficient. So the water horsepower is equal to the flow in gallons per minute times the head in feet times the specific gravity divided by a constant of 3960. So I'm using a little example here of a pump that's um, 2,000 gallons per minute at 100 feet. Specific gravity, uh, for testing purposes, we use uh, one as the specific gravity and divide that by 3960. If you do the arithmetic out, it comes out to 50.5 horsepower. 
Now the difference between water horsepower and pump horsepower or brake horsepower is that we now have to include the efficiency. So the formula is exactly the same, but you'll notice uh, you're dividing by not only 3960, but also by the efficiency. And in this case, I've arbitrarily assigned 85% um, to the efficiency. So when you divide uh, 2000 times 100 times one divided by 3960 divided by 0.85, it comes out to 59.4 horsepower. So the theoretical horsepower is 50.5, which is also the water horsepower and the actual brake horsepower that it takes to uh, run the pump is 59.4. And the difference between those two is the efficiency. So if I go to the next slide. I hey Rich, before then, you get off that slide, the yep. 3960, can you give us a quick definition of where that came from? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a weird number, but uh, it evolved from, uh, a value that was established by uh, James Watt. James Watt was one of the people uh, from a historic perspective that uh, advanced the technology for steam engines. And one of his first applications was for pumping horsepower, I'm sorry, pumping water. And uh, he was trying to get his steam engine to relate to the uh, standard of uh, power production, which was essentially draft horses at the time. Uh, so he lobbied, he wanted his steam engine to be uh, compatible with horses. So he lobbied and he got uh, the standards commission at the time to agree that a, a, a horse could produce 550 foot pounds per second, which would be equal to one horsepower. So if you use that value of 550 foot-pounds per second times 60 seconds, that's 33,000, divided by 8.33 pounds per gallon, it comes out to approximately 3960. And so that's the conversion that we use um, based on the agreement that uh, James Watt uh, agreed that the horse and his steam engine would be equivalent at roughly 550 foot-pounds per second. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, it does. Okay, I'm gonna go off to the next slide here and just show you that pump efficiency is equal to the water horsepower divided by the brake horsepower. And in our case, uh, we said that the water horsepower is calculated at 50.5 and the brake horsepower was measured at 59.4. You divide the 50.5 by 59.4 and you come out to 0.85 or 85%. So that's where pump efficiency comes from. Okay, so uh, we've touched base on uh, how to generate a pump curve and what is the difference between horsepower um, and brake horsepower. Now, the other thing is that the because the, the pump is connected directly, let me go back a few slides here so we make sure that we're all on the same page. Sorry, I meant to go to the other. Let me go back here to that original photograph. Here we are. Oops, sorry about that. It's one of the challenges of working with computers. Okay. So uh, when we talk about, uh, again, brake horsepower, we're talking about the power at the pump shaft. <clears throat> now, pumps are a bit unique in terms of the mechanical equipment that's uh, floating out there today, is that uh, there's very little in the way of drive losses uh, in a pump. So the output of the motor is virtually equal to the input of the pump shaft. So in this particular case, where we have the electric motor here, and I've got my cursor on that, and then we have the pump sh shaft here. The, the losses between here, even when you uh, connect it up with the coupling, is, uh, is negligible. And so we say that the output of the motor is equal to the input of the pump. So essentially, the brake horsepower is equal to the motor horsepower in this case. Now, uh, because in this example, uh, the pump uses a coupling, the uh, the 
drive loss uh, in the coupling itself is negligible as long as the pump shaft and the motor shaft are aligned within five thousandths of an inch in both the horizontal and vertical planes. Um, if you do not align the pump, let's say that you're off by a few thousandths, um, and the flex coupling is allowed to flex during each rotation, then some of that energy is converted into heat, and there would be uh, losses. Uh, so that's why it's so important to not only align the pump for purposes of uh, smooth operation and vibration, but also in terms of efficiency. Okay, so now let's go into uh, an actual pump selection. I'm going to go now over to our website and I'm going to go to the home page. So here we are at the uh, Takeo's home page. And if you'll notice in the upper left hand corner, it says takeocomfort.com. That's our home page for our website. And I'm going to make a quick selection on the same pump, the 2000 gallons per minute at 100 feet of head. So on the left side of the screen, I'm going to click on apps, and then I'm going to click on pump selection. And for now, I'm going to zoom in here, and I'm at the pump selection app, and there are four steps. The first step is to decide the pump type. Now, you can select either OE pumps, which stands for optimized efficiency, self-sensing variable speed pumps, or standard pumps. So for this first example, we're going to leave it on standard pumps. And I'll scroll down a little bit. And for the design flow, we said we would put in 2,000 gallons per minute. So I'm typing in 2,000 gallons per minute and a design head of 100 feet. That's 100 feet. And I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to leave it for step three. It says options here. I'm going to leave it at water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit for now. So when I'm selecting a pump on the RPM, I leave the selection at all. If I click on the down arrow for a moment, you can see that you can uh, select 1160, 1760, or 3500. But I always like to leave it at all initially because I want to see what the software is providing. Now, since we're working right now in the United States and in Canada, uh, most of the U.S., Canada, North America is, uh, I think virtually all of it is 60 hertz. Uh, but there are places in South America, only a few, that run on 50 hertz. Most of Europe runs on 50 hertz, and most of the Middle East and Asia run on 50 hertz. So we're just going to leave it at 60 hertz for now. And the units I'm going to leave at US. And for this first example, I'm going to leave it the number of pumps at one. And just to show you, um, let me just click on the motor hertz you can see. So I'm leaving it at 60, but the only choice you have is 60 or 50. And the US units or SI, which stands for System International, which is the metric system. And for now, I'm going to leave it on one pump. I click on the down arrow, you can see I have multiple pumps in parallel, but I'm going to leave it at one pump for now. And then the thumbnail is based on performance. The only option there is performance or pump image. I'm going to leave it on performance. It's going to sort the data by performance. Step four is to choose the pump. So for this example, today I happen to like vertical inline pumps. So I'm just going to click on vertical inline. I'm going to deselect KV. I like KS pumps today because of the split coupled and I'm gonna click on search. And when I do that, it's gonna populate on the right side of the screen here, all the different pumps that meet the criteria of 2000 gallons per minute and 100 feet of head. Now it, it sorts the pumps, let's see how many is it actually selected? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so it's sorted the pumps from highest efficiency to lowest. If you'll notice on the efficiency line here, that uh, column, is uh, highest to lowest. If I click on the efficiency, it'll resort the pumps from uh, lowest to highest. It starts off at 58% and goes up to 81%, but I'm going to leave it on the initial one from highest to lowest. Um, you'll also notice that it has the value of NPSH, and right now if I click on NPSH, it'll sort it from the lowest to highest, and you can see the arrows pointing up, 
if I click on NPSH again, it'll sort it from highest to lowest. So I'm gonna leave it uh, sorted by efficiency and I'm gonna leave it from highest to lowest for a moment. Okay, so let's say that I like the uh, first selection for a moment and actually I like the second one, it's a little nicer. And uh, So I'm going to select the pump, it's a KS8013 Diaz and David and it has 80% efficient. I click on that and um, I'm gonna scroll down here. Right now you can see, let me blow this up a little bit so everyone can see. So the uh, motor horsepower or the brake horsepower is 63.39 and the non-overloading horsepower is 68.95. I'll, I'll talk about non-loading off horsepower in a moment. So I wanna make a pump motor selection. So I want a motor that's greater than 68.95 because the non-overloading horsepower is the maximum amount of horsepower this pump can consume at 1760 RPM and 11.4 inches. So if I select a 75 horsepower motor, I know that the motor will never overload for this particular pump impeller combination. For the enclosure, I'm just going to pick ODP, which stands for open drip proof, and the pressure I'm gonna select is 125 pounds for now. And I'm gonna type in 460 volt, three phase, 60 hertz. Okay, so now I'm gonna scroll down. I'm gonna click on the actual pump curve so we can get a better picture of it. And I'm gonna shrink this and move it up just to here. Here, I think I've got the whole thing. Okay, so here the red line is uh, similar to the line that we uh, graphed earlier, not the same pump, but the same basic characteristics. So the red line is the relationship between the flow and the head for this particular pump running at 1760 RPM. Let me go back here. When the impeller, when the impeller is trimmed to 11.4 inches. So that red line represents the impeller trimmed at 11.4 inches. So when someone specifies a pump, uh, for a commercial pump, in this particular pump, the impeller diameter, maximum impeller diameter is 13.5 inches. So we will actually cut the impeller, put it in a lathe and uh, trim the diameter down to 11.4 inches in order to meet the duty point for this particular application. Okay, now let me point out a few other pieces of data. I'm gonna blow this up a little bit so we can kind of zoom in and see a few other pieces of data that's demonstrated here. So let's just repeat the operating points, 2000 gallons per minute at 100 feet of head. That's where the red dot is placed at the intersection of those two points and that falls on the pump curve. We have other information here. These dotted lines that go from the lower right to the upper left, those are lines of constant motor horsepower. Okay, so it starts off with 40 horsepower, next motor size is 50, then 60 and 75, and finally 100. Now our pump is operating at 2000 gallons per minute and 100 feet of head, which means that it's operating just slightly above uh, 60 horsepower. I can go back to the narrative data just to remind myself that the brake horsepower is 63.39, and that's what's demonstrated here on the pump curve. Again, you can see that the design operating point is above the 60 horsepower line. If I follow the pump curve all the way down to the end over the entire pump curve, my horsepower consumption right now is probably closer to 66. Let's go back here and see what the non-overloading horsepower was. Oh, around 68, we'll call it 69. So that means that if I follow to the right, the horsepower increases and the maximum in this case is approximately 69. So if I install a 75 horsepower motor, that it doesn't matter where I am on that pump curve, the pump curve will not overload the motor over the entire pump curve. And that's where that frame, I'm sorry, that's where that phrase comes from, non-overloading horsepower. That means that the maximum horsepower that this pump can consume at 1760 RPM and 11.4 inches in diameter 
is roughly 69. And if the electric motor is greater than that value, then it will not overload the electric motor. So that's the non-overloading horsepower. Now, the other lines that are shown here, these curved lines, um, one falls right, right through the pump here, and it says it's 80%. Let's see what the narrative told us. Yes, this pump is running at 80% efficient. And if you'll notice, if I follow the efficiency curves all the way up to the maximum impeller diameter for a moment, at the maximum impeller diameter 13.5 inches, the maximum efficiency for that 13.5 inches is 86.5%. And there's a name for that, and that is the BEP, or best efficiency point. So the BEP occurs at a given speed at the maximum impeller diameter for that model pump at that given speed. So again, repeating, this pump is running at 1760 RPM. The maximum impeller diameter would be 13.5 inches. The maximum efficiency at that maximum impeller diameter at that speed of 1760 is 86.5%, and we call that the BEP, or the best efficiency point. So there's another term. That's important to, to learn. So just summarizing, um, the red line is the pump curve. The dotted lines are the lines of constant motor horsepower, and the curved lines are lines of efficiency. And then we have this blue line that starts way down here in the left lower corner um, at 0, 0, and that blue line is called the system curve. Now, the, the system curve is the uh, characteristics of the system Whatever this pump uh, is, wherever this pump rather is going to operate in the system, regardless of where it is, the system curve, wherever the system curve intersects the pump curve is where it's operating in the system. So in this particular case, the, um, the system curve originates at 2,000 gallons per minute and 100 feet of head, which is simultaneously. Um, I'm sorry, where it intersects, again, the pump curve, and that's our design operating point. Okay, the other piece of data, let me just scroll out just a little bit here. Um, if I start, again, at 2,000 gallons per minute and I run vertically upward till I get to the NPSH uh, chart, and, it, and I read the value over to the left, it says that for this pump running at 2,000 gallons per minute, that it's net positive suction head required by this pump is 25 feet. And in this context, the 25 is uh, feet of absolute water column. So it's absolute pressure. Now, if we go back to the narrative, it should have also summarized that. And there it is. The NPSH required by the pump is 75 feet. Now, in an upcoming uh, Takeo Tuesday uh, webinar, we are going to go into what net positive suction head required and available is in much more detail. But for today, uh, we're just going to say that the available pressure must always be greater than the required pressure by the pump. So in our specific case, we have uh, 2,000 gallons per minute, follow that vertically upward where it intersects this curve is 25 feet, so the pump requires a net positive suction head of 25 feet, and when we calculate the pressure that's available in the system, the available pressure has to be greater than the required pressure of the pump in order to keep the pump from cavitating. Uh, so when we do the webinar on the details of NPSH, we'll cover that in much more detail. Okay, so, um, there is a that was a quick summary in terms of how you can select a pump and how you can read the pump curve, how you generate a pump curve, how you read a pump curve, and all the data that's on the pump curve. Any questions out there, Brett, before I go on to the next topic? Uh, we do have a couple questions, Rich. Uh, uh, for, first off, when you look at this uh, selection that you have here in the pump curve and the system curve, uh, one of the questions, uh, I don't really come across this question too often, um, how close can we get to the zero flow slash max, which is deadhead, um, uh, and run that pump for longer periods of time? And what are the detrimental factors in such case? So in this case, um, if we ran it at 200, roughly 200 GPM at, uh, what is it, about 100 and, I don't know, 130, 130 feet, 
uh, how close can you get to that deadhead point? Uh, that's a great question, Brett. So the general rule of thumb is that you want to be approximately 15% of the flow at the BEP. So if you'll notice um, in this pump selection, I have selected 2000 gallons per minute. If I follow that line vertically up, it intersects the red pump curve at 100 feet. And if I follow that vertical line upwards, you can see it, it happens to be very close to the BEP. In other words, the flow for this pump at the BEP would be just over 2000 gallons per minute. So the minimum flow that we recommend would be roughly 15% of that. So if I take 2000 gallons per minute times 0.15, that's 300 gallons per minute. So that means that we would not want to run this pump less than 300 gallons per minute. Um, so if we go over here, there's 500 gallons per minute. This is one, two, three. So we would not want to go to the left of this point over here. Now, the reality is that when someone uses this uh, pump in a system, most modern systems have variable speed pumping. Uh, so you're never actually going to get to that point. But as a rule of thumb, we do not want to run the pump less than 15% of the flow that occurs at BEP. Hopefully that answers that question. And, and, and that's because of um, uh, added stresses on the pump, correct? Yeah, and, and probably the, the biggest issue is having enough pressure and flow to lubricate the mechanical seal. If we don't have enough flow and pressure, we can't lubricate the seal. We can't create a film of water between the rotating part of the seal and the stationary part. The seal will heat up and it'll destroy itself in a very short period of time which is one of the other reasons why when we do a field test of the shutoff head, we only do that for a couple of seconds and then we uh, immediately open the valve. Here's a, I have two, two other questions here. Does TACO include MPSH margin in their numbers or is it reflective of MPSH3? I'm not sure I've heard of the MPSH3. Well, the MPSH3 in accordance with the Hydraulic Institute is the 3% rule so that the NPSH, um, the way in which we measure NPSH in the laboratory is when the performance degrades by 3% um, uh, prior to the pump cavitating. So in a normal uh, uh, pump test, we uh, close the discharge valve in order to generate the pump curve. Well, the way in which we generate the NPSH data is rather than closing the discharge valve, we begin throttling the uh, valve on the suction side of the pump. And when the power degrades by 3% as compared to the same uh, differential pressure across the pump on the, when we close the discharge valve is when we close the suction valve, um, that 3% degradation uh, in power uh, means that the pump is cavitating. So at that 3% point, you can't, most of the time you can't hear the pump, but we can measure it in power consumption. And so when the power consumption degrades by 3%, then uh, we know the pump is cavitating. And so that's actually a standard developed by the Hydraulic Institute. Okay, anything else, Brett? Um, I'm how far will the duty point move up and down the curve during operation? And I'm not sure if he's talking about the system or pump curve, but uh, maybe you can just make a, a general discussion on that. Okay, let me blow the pump curve up a little bit here so you can kind of see what's going on. So, um, so there are two major uh, categories of systems. Those uh, systems that have a fixed system curve so way back in the day, uh, they used to have for heating systems, which is probably the most popular, um, they had three-way valves on the terminal devices. So the three-way valves would either allow water to flow through the terminal device coil or bypass the coil. In a three-way valve operation, essentially, you had a, sick, a fixed flow and you had a fixed system curve. Well, people uh, realized that you could save energy by replacing those three-way valves with two-way valves. And when you did that, as the two-way valves began to modulate closed, 
from the 100% open position, the system curve would bend upwards to the left. So what's drawn right here is shown at 2,000 gallons per minute at 100 feet. You could imagine that if that's connected to a two-way valve system, as those valves begin to modulate closed, the system curve is going to bend upwards to the left, and it's going to ride the pump curve to the left. Um, you can have the, the pump can operate to the right of the system curve. Generally, that happens when someone has um, overestimated the pressure drop. So in other words, the original system curve was um, anticipated to be 2,000 gallons per minute, 100 feet. But what if in reality there was less resistance? If there was less resistance in the system, you'd have a system curve that bend downwards to the right, so it would ride the pump curve to the right. So generally speaking, we run into an issue when someone has oversized the pump and the pump is riding to the right of the original design point. Now we can have someone that's uh, undersized the pump and you can have the pump moving to the left of the uh, design operating point. The system curve bends upwards to the left. But the majority of the time in most systems that are sized properly, if it's a variable speed, I'm sorry, let's use the two-way valve. Uh, first, uh, the two-way valve causes the system curve to bend upwards to the left, and we say that the system curve rides the pump curve left and right. That's the first situation. The second situation is when we have a variable speed pump and we have a two-way valve uh, system, and then we have two things happening. The system curve is bending upwards to the left, and the pump curve is slowing down as a function of the control strategy. And so you have multiple pump curves that are parallel to this original curve that are underneath this, and then you have the system curve bending upwards to the left. So those are the two situations where you can be riding up and down the pump curve, depending on the system curve shape, I'm sorry, the system curve position and the speed of the pump. It's quite a dynamic uh, situation uh, in actuality. <laughs> right. And uh, just to confirm, the, syst uh, the system curve isn't selected, it, it's actually calculated. It's a calculated uh, um, uh, value. Correct. It's calculated and it starts with the design operating point and it follows the general equation that says that the final pressure is equal to the initial pressure times the ratio of the flow squared. Uh, and so that basically creates a parabola. Uh, pumps don't run in the negative flow. And so you only see the right half of the parabola that's plotted here on the pump curve. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Let's see, how are we doing for time, Brett? Oh, we're doing excellent here. Well, that's great. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about what the different pump types are. So I'm gonna load another thing here. Bear with me one second. And... Oh, I know what the problem is. I don't have my glasses on. Sorry, folks. I'm going to put on my glasses, and then I can just click on this. And I'm going to scroll down quickly here for this presentation. And we'll go into different pump categories. Okay. So uh, one of the things that people ask all the time is they say, well, what pump should I use? And, and again, for our purposes right now, we're just talking commercial pumps. And so let's just look at a couple of different pump configurations. So the most popular pump that's manufactured today is called the end suction pump. And in this photograph, we're showing a, a series of end suction pumps. Uh, this is called a base mounted pump, where the pump motor and the pump itself are mounted to a base and the the motor shaft and the pump shaft are connected to a coupling. Now, the second category is also an end suction pump, but in the second category, the impeller is mounted directly on the motor. It's not base mounted, and so there's no coupling between the two. So the first pump is called a, a base or frame mounted pump that has a coupling, and the second one is a close coupled pump that has no base and no coupling. Uh, but they're both end suction pumps. Uh, the second category of pumps, uh, which are vertical inlines, and the first one I'm showing you is a vertical inline which has a, an adapter between the electric motor at the top and the pump at the bottom. And the adapter is this device that's in the middle. 
One of the advantages of a vertical inline pump is that it doesn't require any field alignment uh, because the pump adapter and I'm sorry, start down here. Pump adapter and motor are they're all three devices are machine fit, and so you don't require any uh, adjustment or alignment in the field. If you go back to the previous, um, the close coupled, the close coupled end suction pump does also does not require any field adjustment or alignment. However, the base mounted pump does require field adjustment or alignment. So those are the um, first diff uh, couple of different categories. And the other uh, popular vertical inline pump is a close coupled pump. And again, uh, the impeller is mounted directly on the motor shaft. The major difference between this pump and the previous pump is that a KS model allows us to take this uh, grill off the, the adapter and remove the coupling that's inside there, and that allows us to service the seal without physically removing the electric motor. So a lot of people like the KS model, especially in the larger horsepower, is because it's much more convenient for servicing the pump. You don't have to take the motor off. Okay. The next category are self-sensing pumps, and they can be provided uh, both in the uh, vertical inline and in the uh, base-mounted. Hard, I'm sorry, base-mounted end suction, both the base-mounted and the close coupled. Uh, the next category, starting to get into larger pumps, uh, is called a horizontal split case, which is our GT series. And the horizontal split case is usually used in much higher flow. In this case, the pump can go up to about 19,000 gallons per minute. To put things in perspective, the average size residential uh, in-ground swimming pool holds about 20,000 gallons of water, which means that this pump running close to 20,000 gallons could fill that pool in just one minute. That's, that's a lot of water flowing through a pump. And then the other category uh, for larger commercial pumps are the TA series. If you'll notice, I'm going to go back and forth. The GT series, those are the largest ones that go up to 19,000 gallons per minute, and the TA series goes up to 5,500 gallons per minute. Um, they are both vertical, I'm sorry, horizontal split case pumps. Now, the next category is called a TC series, and if you'll notice, this has the connections at the top of the pump on both the suction and the discharge. Uh, we actually um, shipped about, I think, 21 of these uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to a project in Virginia, somewhere in Virginia. Um, and they ranged from, in that group, they ranged from, I think it was 40 horsepower up to 350 horsepower. So those are good sized pumps. The next pump is almost identical to the TC series. It's called a TS. And if you'll notice, the suction is connected to the pump on the horizontal inlet, and the discharge is on the vertical outlet. Uh, these two pumps are essentially identical in terms of performance. If you'll notice, they're both 11,000 gallons per minute with a maximum of 400 horsepower, and uh, the TS is the same. It's just configured differently. Uh, so some people would like the uh, TS versus the TC, depending on how they want to set up their piping system. Okay, and just a couple of more. Vertical turbine pumps are becoming uh, very popular on the commercial side of things. Uh, they're used uh, in cooling tower applications. I was just out in uh, Oklahoma State University a few weeks ago. Actually, it's been a, just about a month ago now. And uh, they have, uh, I think they have a total of three vertical turbine pumps that are pumping 12,000 gallons each from their cooling towers to their chillers. Each chiller, I believe, was 4,000 tons. So that was an interesting project. Uh, and then we get into uh, some of the smaller commercial pumps. Uh, these are inline pumps. Um, there are actually only four major categories of pumps. There's end suction, vertical inline, horizontal split case, and vertical split case. Uh, and these smaller pumps are essentially variations of inline pumps. 
And that's the only, uh, I wanna stop here in terms of the different types of pumps uh, that are available. We manufacture uh, lots of other uh, types of pumps and the, uh, our team that handles the, uh, the residential and wholesale Takeo Tuesday presentations uh, will cover uh, the pumps that are generally uh, in that category, but I'm gonna end the discussion about different pump types here. Okay, um, let's then go back to uh, project builder. I wanna show you a few other things. Any questions about different types of pumps, Brett, before we get into? Uh, no, all set. Okay, great. We are going to go back here to our pump selection app, and we're gonna show you a little bit about Project Builder. So in our example, we selected this pump, and it's a KS8013D as in David, and we filled in the 75 horsepower, made it open drip proof, ODP's open drip proof, 125 uh, ANSI class. Uh, the flange is ANSI 125 class. Now we're going to uh, save the information that we just created in Project Builder. So let's scroll down and create a project name. So I'm just gonna uh, call it Webinar Pre 24 2020, that's today. And then for this particular pump, I'm gonna call this P-1. Now I'm going to attach documents, and I'm just going to attach a submittal data sheet for now. I can attach more documents and add more information, but for a webinar presentation, it tends to slow things down just a little bit. So I'm going to just I'll pick a couple of options here. Then click on Project Builder, and then go to Project Builder. And now what's going to happen is that the Project Builder software is going to start creating uh, a database of all of the different equipment that I want to select for this project. So this project is called Webinar 324 2020. And the first pump, it started to create a schedule sheet. So you can see there's the pump tag that I put in P1, it's the KS8013D. Let me blow this up a little so you can see that a little bit easier. There you go. Um, 2000 GPM, it's a vertical pump, 2000 GPM, 100 feet. And I scroll to the right, selected at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 80% efficient and so on. All the data that we saw before is now on the schedule sheet, along with the motor horsepower, 1760 RPM. There's the NPSH required by this pump. There's a non-overloading horsepower, the design horsepower, and the motor horsepower and the voltage. All right, so now, now that I have this, I can export this project. Let me click on export here. So I can click on export and then a dialog box will open up and I can download the zip file. It takes a few seconds. In the lower left-hand corner, it shows you the progress. It says waiting for the apps. And there it goes, it just downloaded the zip file. Now I'm gonna open that zip file just to show you what's in there. Uh, it started to create a schedule in um, Excel spreadsheet. There's all the data. So that allows you to import this data directly into AutoCAD if you're working with an AutoCAD product, that sort of thing. And the other thing is that it has, whoops, let me just get rid of that. Um, it's also created uh, starting to create the submittal package. So if you notice the job in this case is the webinar 324, 2020, and I'm going to just uh, page through here. Um, you can see that all the dimensional, let me blow that up just a little bit so you can see what's going on. Okay, so we can see all of the pump information here, the dimensional data, it's starting to build all of this stuff. This is the generic pump curve. And then also, which is really cool, it shows you the actual pump curve with the narrative data 
on the left side. So let me shrink that down just a hair so you can see the whole thing. There it is. So there's that pump curve that we were looking at before. And on the submittal data sheet, it includes the narrative data to the left and the pump curve data to the right. So now you have a lot of information that you can refer to. Okay, now I wanna show you a couple of uh, quick things here. Let's leave that for a moment. Let's, uh, let's go back to my, I have this dialog box that I showed you a moment ago that says download zip file. I'm gonna close that window, click on close window. If I want to share this project, I can click on share this project. And let's say I wanted to share this with Brett. So I just uh, click on Brett. I've shared other projects with Brett in the past. And then search for his email, make sure it's in there and it is. Share with user. And now I have two options. I can uh, select the permission level, I can say full access. So when Brett and I are collaborating on a project, I will send him the full access for the information. If I am concerned about the person um, I'm sending the information to, I don't want them to have full access. I don't want them to change the data that I've selected. So I can click on read only, in which case they can have the entire selection process, but they can't uh, change any of the data. So that's the two things that you can do in the share project. Okay, let's also, um, oh, another little uh, thing you can click on here is update project information. So if you'll notice, um, there's webinar 324, 2020. I can click on here, oh, let's say I'm broadcasting from Duxbury, Mass. And then I can say update project builder. And in a few minutes, it'll come back. And now if I export the project, just show you where that shows up here, download the zip file. And you can see in the lower left-hand corner, the progress of the download. There it goes. Now I'm gonna open that document and open up that submittal data sheet. And now you can see that it's not only put in the webinar information. Um, let's see. No, I screwed that up. I apologize. Let me go back here and add a different piece of information here. Update project builder. And where it says engineering firm, let's just call it Guardians of the Galaxy. I like that engineering firm and click on Update Project Builder, export this project, and then download the zip file. And again, it shows the progress in the lower left-hand corner. Give it a few seconds, there it is. And now, since I updated it, you can see under the submittal data sheet, it has Engineers Guardians of the Galaxy. So those are some of the things that you can navigate around and you can use the project builder for that. But the project builder also um, is very powerful because it allows you to do a few other cool things. So I've made this uh, initial pump selection. Uh, let's go back. I can click on the letter P in the pump selection app. It brings me back to the pump selection tool. And I want to do the same uh, pump in this 2,000 gallons per minute, 100 feet, only instead of doing that with one pump, I'm going to do that with two pumps now, all right? And let's assume that I stick with the vertical inline and I stick with the KS, click on search. Now this will be uh, a different pump selection, but I wanted to show you the characteristics. So let's assume that I like this one here, this time, each pump is going to be a thousand gallons per minute at a hundred feet. So I'm going to put in again the non-overloading horsepower is uh, uh, 32.7. I'm sorry, 32.37. So I'm going to select a 40 horsepower motor. I'm going to make it open drip proof. Pressure same as 125. I'm going to fill in the voltage for 60 three-phase, 60 hertz. 
And now I'm going to scroll down. Since I already have the project selected as webinar 324.20, I'm going to call this P2, so P-2. Attach documents, submittal data sheet, and then update project builder, and then go to project builder. So this is the second pump in my project build, the, the project that I'm working on. So P1 is uh, one pump at 2,000 gallons per minute, and P2 is two pumps adding up to 2,000 gallons per minute. And then we can see all the data there. So again, I can export this project, wait for the dialog box to open, download the zip file. Now, again, because we're doing a webinar, I'm limiting the amount of information, uh, but the more pumps that I add, a little bit longer it takes to download this information. So when I'm doing multiple uh, equipment selections, I make all my selections and then I do the, uh, the download the zip file at the end because it could take a little bit longer. So I'm gonna open this up. Now in this case, I have P2 and I have the pump data for P2. And if you'll notice, if I get down to the pump curve here, let me scroll down here. There we go. This time it's a thousand gallons per minute at a hundred feet of head. So there's a thousand gallons per minute and a hundred feet. There is the system curve for one pump operating. And this is the system curve for two pumps, well, not in this case, let's do it, I'm sorry, let's do it the other way. This uh, line is the pump curve for two pumps operating um, at the system design of 2,000 gallons per minute and 100 feet of head. If we ran one of those pumps in that same system curve over here, that one pump would produce 1,500 gallons per minute at roughly, Let's see, is that units of 10, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90? Yes, so that'd be roughly 55 heat, feet. So if you ran one pump in the uh, original system curve in a parallel pump operation, you're going to get 75% of the flow. Um, and if you had one pump operating and then you started the second pump, you would increase the flow. It would go from uh, two, I'm sorry, from 1,500 up to 2,000, and that's an increase of 33%. Look at the, what, the weird thing that happens. If you're over here on the left system curve, and let's say that you had one pump running at 1,000 gallons per minute and 100 feet of head, uh, this uh, curve here would intersect that point. If I started the second pump, I would bump up here, and I would only have a very tiny increase in flow. So it all depends on which system curve you're starting from. So in the first one, um, when I went from 1,500 to 2,000 gallons per minute, that from one pump to two pumps, that was a 33% increase in flow. But if I had a much steeper system curve, I'd only go from 1,000 gallons per minute to 1,050 gallons per minute, roughly, and uh, I'd have a much steeper curve. So one of the challenges uh, when you're using parallel pumps is to find out where your starting point is and where you're going to finish up. One We're, other quick uh, thing. Quick, quickly uh, uh, running out of time, Rich, just to let you know. Okay. Um, well, let me just point out a couple of other quick things. For parallel pumping, if you notice, it says in the right-hand side here, it says P1 plus P2. That indicates that that curve is for two pumps operating in parallel. And then this other value here for this other curve, which is P1 comma P2, that's just one pump operating. So that shows you the characteristics of the parallel pumping. And I'm pretty sure uh, we've covered most of the topics. I did want to show a little bit about troubleshooting. Let me just go back to my original selection for a moment back here. And let's go to this pump curve here. So one of the things that uh, pops up from uh, again, this is our original uh, pump selection, 2,000 gallons per minute, 100 feet. So one of the things that we get asked all the time is, do I have the right impeller diameter? And so we ask to take some measurements in the field, and we do a shutoff head test. 
So for this pump running at 1760 RPM at 11.4 inches impeller diameter, um, the pump curve intersects the zero flow line at roughly, that's 125, 130, 135, about 135 feet. Now there's about a 5% variation plus or minus. So it's probably closer to, um, the, the actual pressure is probably closer to 130 feet. So um, you can use that information for troubleshooting in the field. You can do a quick shutoff head test and you can find out if you do in fact have the right impeller diameter inside your pump. So that covers all the topics that we wanted to touch base on today. Let's go back to our original screen. And this guy here, I'm gonna go all the way down to my favorite part. Brett, do we have any other last minute questions that we have to touch base with? No, um, we'll, we, uh, we can cover the last couple uh, uh, individually. So we're all set. Sounds great. Well, I wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone for uh, signing up and listening to our webinar on the pump selection app and the project builder. Uh, we want to make sure everyone stays safe out there, follow all of the recommendations from the, um, you know, from the local, state, and federal authorities. Uh, it's a very serious condition. We're taking it very seriously at TACO to protect uh, uh, all the folks that are in the TACO family. So thank you again for attending our webinar. I'm turning it back to Brett so he can say goodbye. Thanks, Rich. Uh, great, job, uh, great job as usual. Um, just a reminder that there, uh, tomorrow, uh, roughly uh, 24 hours from now, you'll get an, uh, an email with the uh, video uh, or the tape of the webinar attached uh, or available to you, as well as access to your PDH credit hours. Uh, any, uh, any questions we didn't answer, we'll, get, uh, we'll directly answer them to you. And keep on the alert for other uh, Take O Tuesdays as we are going to be increasing our schedule and we'll go from there. So uh, uh, just keep that in mind. Other than that, stay safe, uh, stay, stay healthy, and wash your hands. Signing off. Goodbye, everybody.